Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Opportunities in Asia via Hong Kong, Food and Wine Industries. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope uh, you'll enjoy the session. Today our presenters will be Tony Wade and Cloris Long from the Hong Kong Trade Development Council and George Davey from the Director of um, Parama Consulting. So let's get started. We have quite a lot to get through, so let's have a look at what's coming up. Please let me know if you're having any troubles hearing me and just um, pop that in the chat box and I'll see if there's, everything's okay. Um, all right, so what's coming up with this webinar? We're going to do a brief introduction of, of who the ECA is and um, HKTDC. We're going to look at why Hong Kong, why are we interested in this market, doing business tips, then we'll branch into the wine industry in Hong Kong, followed by that we'll look at the food industry. And then we have a very interesting case study which we're going to look at and George Davies is going to present for that. Following uh, those sessions, we'll have a Q&A time, so please, uh, you'll notice there's a questions box. If you'd like to enter in your questions throughout the webinar, please do so. Also, please identify to whom you, would, you are um, directing your question. We'll be able to answer some questions as we go. Um, however, we won't be able to get to all of them, so if you could just be patient and, and we'll try to get to your question at the end of the webinar. If we can't get through them all, because there are quite a few of you online today, uh, we will respond to you directly via email and, and do our best to answer your questions. So let's get started. So the Export Council of Australia. The Export Council exists to support and represent Australian exporters and importers. Our uh, core activities include skills development through our partner organisation, the Australian Institute of Export, advocacy on, on issues relating to trade policy, as well as research and events, which includes the New South Wales and Queensland Export Awards. So I'm going to do a shameless plug here. If we have exporters online, please have a look at, the, at applying for the Export Awards. It's a great program and a great way to um, have your company recognised for your export success. Um, all right, so we are going to now move on to look at the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. So the Hong Kong Trade Development Council serves companies interested in using Hong Kong as their trade platform for China and beyond. HKTDC exists, assists businesses to source, sell or produce competitively using Hong Kong partners and services. The Sydney office assists businesses from Australia and New Zealand and their services include assisting with trade fairs, business matching, product magazines, online sourcing, as well as market intelligence. So I'm going to hand over now to Cloris Long. Uh, oh, before I do that, let me just, I can see someone's already asked a question here about the, the PowerPoint. Uh, the, this presentation will be emailed to you, so if you've registered for this webinar, you'll be receiving a copy of this presentation. The recording of the webinar, the full recording will be available in the members area of the Export Council website and a shorter version will be available uh, publicly as well on our YouTube channel. So just so everyone's aware, this presentation that you're seeing now will be emailed to you following today's session. And just a reminder, if you have questions, please email, um, enter them in the questions box and uh, we will get to them as soon as we can. Thank you, and I'm going to hand over now to Cloris Long to begin her presentation. Thank you, Stacey, for the great introduction. And I would also like to thank the Export Council of Australia for giving us the opportunity to do the presentation today. Um, just a little bit of background information on the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. Um, the council is founded in 1966. It's a quasi-government organization. Like Stacey said, um, it's to here to serve companies that are interested in using Hong Kong as a platform to expand to Asia, China, Asia, and beyond. Um, we are here to create, to create opportunities for international trade by providing information, matching business partners, and international trade fairs. There are 700 staff in the Hong Kong head office and 13 offices on Chinese mainland and more than 40 worldwide. And the Hong Kong TDC Sydney office here is here to assist both Australian and New Zealand companies to expand to China and Asia via Hong Kong. Sorry. Yeah, a little bit of information on Hong Kong as a trading hub for Asia. Um, the population is 7 million, 
but there are more than 8, 48 million tourists com coming into Hong Kong every year, and more than 70% of them are from mainland China. China. And there are about 14,000 14, restaurants adopted around Hong Kong, serving a wide range of international cuisines. Hong Kong also has a very strong bars and pubs culture, and there are about more than a thousand of these bars and pubs in the island state. Um, the official language of Hong Kong is both English and Chinese. I can tell you that you will not have problem going around Hong Kong by only speaking English. Hong Kong also has a very large expat population. Um, 90,000 of them are Australians. And many of you already know that Hong Kong returned to China in 1997 and the Chinese government has created a one country, two systems for Hong Kong. What it means is, create, what it means is Hong Kong used the common law system, which is independent from that on the mainland China. And Hong Kong also provides a rule of law that provides legal protection for contracts and international property all over the world. And Hong Kong also has an international arbitration center with arbitral awards enforceable on the mainland. Um, it may not be the case if, if it's the other way around, so this is very important. And Hong Kong has also got the world's first independent commission against corruption and has a very strong anti-corruption culture. The Hong, the Hong Kong dollar is fully convertible and is packed to the US dollar. Um, and the Great China Firewall doesn't really affect Hong Kong at all, so you will have free flow of information in Hong Kong with uncensored information, and you can also use all your social media, including Facebook. Um, Hong Kong government provides level playing field for both local and international business. There's no barriers to entry into the Hong Kong market, and there's also no preferential treatment for local or foreign business. So it's a very fair environment for for you to do business there. Hong Kong also has a very low and simple tax system, which I will explore further in the next slide. Like what I mentioned before, English is the main language for doing business and for business and legal documents. So what it means that when you are doing business with Hong Kong, you don't need to translate all your documents into Chinese before going overseas. So it creates a lot of convenience and saves a lot of time and money. Here is the tax mystery index um, compiled by the Forbes magazine. As you can see, Hong Kong has the lowest overall tax rate than many other countries in the world. Um, the corporate income tax is kept at 16.5% 16 16 and the personal income tax is only 15% maximum. And both employer social security and employee social security is only at 5%. Um, Hong Kong has no VAT, GST or sales tax, no capital gains tax, no withholding tax on investments. Um, Hong Kong has also signed uh, a no double tax agreement with more than 20 countries worldwide. And most importantly for most of you today is there's no wine duty for, for you to import wine into Hong Kong, which we will talk more about that in, in the later presentation. So here are a few tips on how to do business in Hong Kong and China. Um, Hong China is a large country, so you shouldn't be seeing it as the same same place all over the place. Um, so there are different regulatory requirements from one province to the other, especially for local tax and policies. So you need to be very worry about, you really need to look out for your choice of agents and distributors. Um, when they promise you they look after all of China, um, practically it may be possible, but some, most of the time may, may not be very practical for you to do that. And also research your potential partners thoroughly. Um, your partner may not be what they claim to be, so you need to do your background check on, that, on them and also um, probably go to trade fairs to meet some of the potential partners. And also be careful about requests for exclusivity because um, once you sign the exclusivity agreements, you, it's hard for you to get out of it, especially if you've got uh, goods on consignment delivered to your partners. And also support your products and partners through good time and bad time, especially when you first launch the product into the market. 
and also be worried about uh, be uh, also be keep in mind about open market means open to everyone, including both international and domestic competition. Um, China, um, the Chinese market is very good at uh, imitating what you have done successfully in the market. So you really need to have a good angle for both your products or service to defend your products from the from the other copycats. Um, and also um, bear in mind about the Chinese sparkling mentality um, because um, Chinese they, they like to bargain your floor is my ceiling so make sure that you don't bring your lowest price onto the negotiation table and show it to your to your counterpart and also bring lots of business cards um, when you do business in China and Hong Kong, the first thing you do is to shook hands and the second thing is to bring out your business cards. There are a lot of times that I've seen business, they come to Hong Kong or China without bringing any business cards or they run out of business cards. Um, so make sure that you, you print lots of them before you get onto the plane. And um, try to attend as many trade fairs as possible, be proactive and wear comfortable shoes. And after the fair, make sure you follow up because when you do business in Hong Kong and China, you expect to have a long lead time for negotiation. Unlike in the Western society, everything is dealt with and talked about in the boardroom. In China, you really need to build on the relationship in the boardroom as well as outside. So you really need to understand the importance of building a relationship and also the importance of face when you are doing business in Hong Kong and China. Now I pass my presentation, second half of the presentation to my colleague Tony. Tony will talk about the food and wine industry in Hong Kong. Thank you, Tony. Well, thank you, Clarice, and, and thank you for the, the overview of the Hong Kong market. Um, I'm now going to look more specifically um, at the food and beverage sector, particularly the food and wine industries, and the opportunity for Australian producers in the Hong Kong market. So first of all, why Hong Kong? Uh, everyone is talking about uh, China, but let's look more specifically at, at Hong Kong and the specific opportunities there. Now, in 2008, the Hong Kong government removed all duty on wine imports into Hong Kong. As a result of this, Hong Kong has, has emerged as a sophisticated wine market. Um, the removal of the tax coincided with the launch of the Hong Kong International Wine and Spirits Fair, now in its sixth year, and we'll explore that a little bit more later on. A significant pool of experienced wine merchants have established themselves in Hong Kong, with around 850 wine-related companies setting up between 2008 and 2009 as a result of the abolition of the duty. Hong Kong has the highest average consumption of wine per capita in Asia with locals consuming around 5.3 litres of wine a year in 2012, and this figure is increasing. Hong Kong is also the gateway to other Asian wine markets and is a major wine trading hub and auction centre. Australia is the second largest supplier of wine to Hong Kong, and this is valued at $89 million US in 2013. Total imports of wine into Hong Kong will reach $1.5 billion by 2017. With wine re-exports from Hong Kong into China reaching $230 US million in 2013. The Chinese mainland is now the number one re-export market from Hong Kong, accounting for around 54% of the market. So when I refer to re-exports, I'm referring to wine that is being um, shipped into Hong Kong and then re-distributed um, into mainland China. Now one of the reasons for this is the zero tax on wine into Hong Kong. 
and also the, the freight facilities in, in Hong Kong which make it very re easy to re-export. A point to note is that the zero tax is for Hong Kong only and not for mainland China. And the taxes into mainland China vary from province to province, so there's not a fixed figure that I can actually provide for the level of tax into, into the mainland. Okay, as I mentioned, there is no duty on uh, alcohol, but that is up to alcohol of 30%. So, of course, that includes all wine, but not some of the strongest spirits. So that's just a point to note. Um, as I, we also spoke about um, with regards to re-export into mainland China, Hong Kong state-of-the-art wine, wine storage facilities actually also make it an easy centre for re-export into the China market. There are now a total of 38 fine wine and commercial storage facilities. So for anyone looking at uh, exporting premium wine, um, you know that once it reaches Hong Kong, it will be cared for very well in the storage facilities there. Um, Hong Kong's customs facilities offer the streamlined custom clearance from Hong Kong into mainland China. Another reason to consider Hong Kong if you are looking at exploring the mainland market. Hong Kong has also emerged as the largest wine auction centre in the world, now surpassing both London and New York, with auction sales amounted to 130 million US dollars in 2012. Renowned auction houses including Christie's, Sotheby's and Bonin's all now have offices in Hong Kong. So some advantages um, and opportunities in the Hong Kong market and some things to be mindful of. Um, wine drinking is uh, perceived to have health benefits um, and as such um, the, the information that has been available in the market um, surrounding red wine and its health benefits make it the preferred and dominant choice for consumers in the Hong Kong and China market. Um, organic and biodynamic wines are becoming increasingly popular in the Hong Kong market and buyers are now actively seeking out these wines for consumption. There is a growing online community of wine buyers and they're savvy. They're looking at um, referring to comments and reviews before they make a wine purchase, particularly if this is for gifting. Food and wine matching uh, sessions have emerged as a, a common trend and people are interested in, in participating in events where wine is paired with the food to highlight um, the, the benefits of effective matching. Um, also tell your story. If you have a particular story to tell about your wine, if it has anything that's unique, all of this helps to sell your story and sell your wine into the market whether that be a long family history in the industry, old vines, a story about the winemaker, all of these things will help sell your brand into the market. Okay, if we look at the con consumption trends now of wine drinkers in Hong Kong, 51% of consumers enjoy a glass of wine several times a week with many drinking each day, up to 21% consuming each day. On an annual average spend, the average Hong Kong consumer will spend around 650 US dollars on wine purchases in any one year. Popular wine grape varieties include Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Shiraz, while Chardonnay is the dominant white wine variety. New World Wines are receiving increasing demand from both Hong Kong and China and some of these reasons include the fact that they're seen as being clean and green and safe. Uh, the wine varieties are easy to understand and they are developing some knowledge around the regionality of Australian wine regions. Alright, 
wine consumption, a large majority of, of consumers drink at home and in restaurants. Um, and supermarkets do um, are a ready market for, for wine. Unlike Australia, supermarkets, convenience stores all have wine readily available. 33% of wine sales through supermarkets and convenience stores. The price per bottle that consumers are prepared to pay are between 30 and 50 US Australian dollars. So you can see they are savvy consumers and they're prepared to pay for quality wine. If we look at purchases in hotels and bars, and there is a very significant bar scene and restaurant scene in Hong Kong, the average spend is between 50 and 70 US dollars um, in these uh, hotels and bars. Okay. A few uh, tips to help get your brand into the, uh, the market. Develop some brand recognition. Um, so use the likes of social media uh, to push your message out about the wine. Use any opportunity at all for publicity. Ratings and awards are highly regarded and do um, make a considerable difference to whether a wine is consumed. So highlight these, um, identify the regionality of the wine and if you have any reviews by the likes of James Halliday, make sure you put that out there because it really does sway a buyer as to whether or not they choose your brand against another one. Positioning, don't think that the Hong Kong market is, is all about low-end wine. As we've seen previously, consumers are prepared to spend on quality wine. Also look at things like wine packaging. Uh, the average home in Hong Kong is small and uh, consumption is, is still less than somewhere like Australia. So smaller bottle options are um, well received in the market. Also look at your labelling. Uh, I 